David Lewis provides a fairly sophisticated defense of compatibilism in his article, Are We Free to Break the Laws? And this is much more sophisticated than the other videos that I've covered on compatibilism from Stace and Hobart. So buckle up, let's do some metaphysics. First of all, let's make sure we understand what soft determinism is. And we're using Lewis's conception, and this has a traditional definition. The idea of soft determinism is the thesis that sometimes one freely does what one is determined to do. In other words, we are free and determinism is true. Yet, one is, at times, able to do other than what one did. Even if determinism is true, one has the ability to do otherwise, or as I abbreviate it, the atto. So, the past history and the laws of nature determine that one did not act otherwise, yet one could have done so. Wow. Okay, let's see how this works. First of all, compatibilism is the thesis that soft determinism may be true. The idea that you could have determinism being true and have freedom with the ability to do otherwise. So we're defining freedom in the way that the libertarian prefers, including the idea of having that positive ability of taking an action which one did not have to take, having the ability to choose how the future turns out. Now, uh, a little bit more on soft determinism. So Lewis is a compatibilist. He defends, but he does not endorse soft determinism. So he's, he's not claiming that this is how the world is actually, but he says this is how the world could be. It's possible that it's true. So in other words, from his uh, metaphysics, there is a possible world in which determinism is true and there are people who act freely and have the ability to do otherwise. Of course, the challenge here is that soft determinism seems to imply that sometimes we're able to act in such a way that the laws of nature are broken. That is the best option, uh, according to Lewis. So. Let's make sure that we're clear on how this works. Lewis considers a situation where he puts his hand down on his desk. So this is the action that he takes. He's uh, putting his hand down. He could have raised it in the air, but that's what he did. Suppose, though, that this is a predetermined action because Lewis is living in a deterministic world where the previous states of affairs determine only one physically possible future. So that means there's a historical proposition H. That would be about the entire state of the world in the past. And then we have a proposition L, which of course is going to be an amazingly, incredibly long proposition, specifying all the laws of nature, so that H and L determine that Lewis put his hand down. H and L imply that Lewis puts his hand down. Now, what if he could have done otherwise? What if Lewis had raised his hand instead? If he had raised his hand instead, one of three things are going to have to be true. Either contradictions would, would have been true. Now, uh, we'll consider our other options because this doesn't look very good. H would not have been true, the statement about the history of the entire world. L or L would not have been true. One of those three things has to be false, right? Or, well, one of these three, the way they're written, have to be true in order for Lewis to raise his hand instead. Well, one's ruled out. Lewis is not going to throw out the most fundamental principle of reasoning. He holds to the principle of non-contradiction. 
so we can't have contradictions being true. And Lewis certainly agrees with most all other philosophers that we can't have one. And two is ruled out because Lewis argues, and he does this elsewhere, that you cannot time travel, or if you do, you're tra actually, it's a description of a different possible world. That's how you have to describe it. So you can't change the past, all right? So two is ruled out. So what are we left with? Three is our only option. So if I raised my hand, that is, if Lewis had raised his hand, L would not have been true. Okay, so we have a law that was broken. And that's how Lewis provides for the ability to do otherwise in a deterministic world. It's a situation where a law of nature is broken. Okay. Now, immediately an objection comes to mind here, and that is simply, look, you cannot break the laws of nature. Uh, that cannot be done. Now, Lewis goes on to clarify, he wants to distinguish between the two theses as follows. So we have the weak thesis. I am able to do something such that if I did it, a law would have been broken. And we're going to consider examples here in just a moment. Or the strong thesis, I am able to break a law. And Lewis says these are importantly different, and he's not going to endorse the strong thesis. So let's see how this works. Let's, let's try to make sure that we're really clear on this. Here are a few examples of abilities that one might have. So first of all, I'm able to break a window. Now, what do we mean by that? We mean I'm able to do something such that if I did it, my action would cause a window breaking event. So the idea here is uh, maybe I can throw a chair hard enough to break the window. So I throw the chair, that's the something I did. And my doing that would cause a window breaking event. Okay. I am able to break a promise. I'm able to do something such that if I did it, a promise would be broken. Now here in the same way that we have a window breaking event that is caused by my action, we could have a promise breaking event caused by my action. But right, I also am able to do something such that itself would be a promise breaking event. So this is a more direct connection, a tighter connection. The action that I take is in fact a promise breaking event. Now, we wanna use the words breaking here because it fits. So window breaking event, promise breaking event, law breaking event, right? It's all parallel here. So if Lewis threw a stone that traveled faster than light, he could do something such that if he did it, he would cause a law to be broken. Now that's one thing, that's like our first example of being able to break a promise. But if he moved his arm faster than the speed of light, he would do something such that the action itself would be a law breaking event, similar to our second example of promise breaking, right? More directly by your action, in your action itself, that is a law breaking event. Okay, so we can distinguish these two types of abilities. Now, Lewis says, look, compatibilism does not imply superpowers. So the raising of his hand, if he raised it instead of putting it on the desk, lowering it down, does not imply that it itself is a law-breaking event, nor does it imply that it causes a law-breaking event. So Lewis says, look, raising my hand does not imply either of these kinds of breaking events, okay? Instead, what we have is 
is this. If he had raised his hand, a law would have been broken. Now, Lewis goes on to explain a law would have been broken prior to the raising of his hand. He calls this a divergence miracle. So the law is broken actually by nature, maybe, by the world uh, acting oddly. Somehow a miracle occurred, and then he raised his hand. So he's able to do otherwise, even though determinism is true. Okay, now let's consider some criticism by Peter Van Inwagen, a libertarian who does not think compatibilism works. So Van Inwagen argues against this view and Lewis considers Van Inwagen's argument. So here's how PVI argues. Suppose in a deterministic world, I did not raise my hand. Okay, that's what we have. But if I did raise my hand, I could have rendered false the conjunction of H and L. Right? The total history of the world in the past and the laws of nature. But I could not have rendered H false. So both Van Inwagen and Lewis agrees on this point, right? You cannot change the past. And since I cannot render H false, then I could have rendered L false, right? If you're going to render false the conjunction of H and L, and you can't render H false, the only way you can do that is by rendering L false, which means I could have rendered L false. But here's the problem. I can't do that. I cannot break a law of nature that is not within my power to do. So I could not have raised my hand. And thus I lack the ability to do otherwise, and I lack freedom in a deterministic world. Now, obviously, this implies that soft determinism is false, cannot be true. So compatibilism is false. Now, Lewis is the one who brought up to the argument. So, of course, he has a response. What is the response to this criticism? Here's what Lewis does. He argues that there is an equivocation in five and six. Now, there's a weak sense of, I could have rendered a proposition false. And that weak sense is, I was able to do something such that if I did it, the proposition would have been falsified. But of course, we're clarifying here, not necessarily directly by my action, right? And then there's the strong sense, of course. The strong sense of the meaning of five is, I could have rendered a proposition false. Okay, the strong sense of that, where we could have rendered L false, right? What would that mean? It means I was able to do something such that if I did it, the proposition, L is the one in question here, would have been falsified either by my act itself, like the promise breaking event, or by some event caused my, by my act, like the window breaking event. Now that's a strong sense. Recall when Lewis was distinguishing those abilities, he then said that raising his hand did not imply either one of those abilities. Ah, but Van Inwagen says it does. Now, uh, let's consider how this uh, dialogue goes. Lewis accepts the weak thesis, okay? So he says, uh, all right, I could have rendered L false in this weak sense of being able to do something such that if he did it, the proposition would have been false. Okay, so he accepts that. But if it's the weak sense throughout the argument, then Lewis denies premise six. He says, well, this claim that I could not have rendered L, L false, well, that's false, right? Because I could have in the weak sense. Now, if we take the strong sense throughout that doing something itself falsified L or my action caused the L breaking event, right? That strong sense, then he says premise five is not true. He would not endorse 
it. Now, obviously, by denying either premise five or premise six, you get out of the contradiction, the reductio ad absurdum argument fails. Okay, so he says, if we take it in the strong sense, he never claims that he could have rendered L false in that strong sense. Okay, PVI supports premises five and six by suggesting a, an analogous statement that is a, maybe more clear, one that does not seem to be ambivalent, and that is, uh, there doesn't seem to be a natural interpretation where you have a weak sense and a strong sense. PVI says, okay, if you don't like this, uh, I could have rendered L false, that simple direct statement, let's clarify it in this way. How about this statement? I was able to arrange things in, in a way such that my arranging things in that way conjoined with the whole truth about the past strictly implies the falsity of R, L, sorry. And so it seems like Lewis has to be committed to this claim. And Van Inwagen says, but wait a minute, that's false, right? I can't do that. I can't cause a law of nature to be broken by something I do, right? Something I do can't imply. My direct actions cannot imply that I break a law, that the law of nature is broken. That, that can't be something that is in my ability to do. I cannot arrange the world in such a way that that happens. Now, maybe another way of thinking about this and this is the way I, put, I would put it uh, in criticizing Lewis, because, of course, being trained by Van Inwagen, I favor him over Lewis. Um, I would put it this way. Okay, suppose a law is broken, so Lewis is able to raise his hand. All right, that's what he wants. He says he has the ability to do otherwise. Uh, some, a divergent miracle occurs. A law of nature is broken. Lewis raises his hand. Suppose we grant him all of that. Lewis says that, aha, this gives you the ability to do otherwise, this gives you freedom, this allows you to have determinism and freedom, so soft compatibilism could possibly be true, soft determinism, rather, sorry, could possibly be true, and that means compatibilism is true. Well, Okay, suppose it does provide the ability to do otherwise. Now, that's all it does, right? Is it in our control when and how we have the ability to do otherwise at all in any sense? Is it in our control when and how we have this ability? Remember, it, re it requires a divergence miracle. And so my answer to that question is no. And if it's never in our control to act otherwise, is that freedom? And again, my answer to this rhetorical question is no, right? It's not under our control. And so can we be free if determinism is true in the way that Lewis describes this? And again, my answer is no. And that's why I reject compatibilism even after Lewis's incredibly sophisticated and really interesting defense of compatibilism. 